that's really going to trip us up is verse 2, which unfortunately is made more difficult by people who learn to rightly divide than what it should be. And so we'll be dealing with, with that verse uh, quite a bit tonight. But starting chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a single sentence in Romans chapter 1. So this is the longest salutation that Paul gives in any of his epistles here in the book of Romans. And part of that may have something to do with the fact he's never been there. And he hasn't been there before, so they're not familiar with him and his ministry there, apart from just word of mouth and third party. We'll cover some more about that maybe next week or, or that following. But it's seven verses, this introduction, and this salutation follows the same pattern Paul gives in all of his epistles, which is that he gives his name, who the epistle's from, Paul, then who he's writing it to. Now that's where you get the, the link, because he says his name in verse 1, and the two's down in verse 7. So in between there, there's some, some more input. And then he ends with grace to you and grace to you in peace, which is his pattern in all of his epistles which if you're following along in the introductions of the books in the New Testament, you'll see that is a good reason to think why Paul did not write Hebrews, is that he did not follow the same pattern in writing that epistle. Um, and the idea that he wanted to be secret just does not really follow Paul's uh, personality that we find in the scriptures. So uh, this is his salutation. Now, Paul in Romans, the book of Romans, is laying a foundation Romans, as we said last week, is a foundational book. It's an essential book doctrinally. And that's what Paul's doing. So even from chapter 1, he's laying a foundation. We'll see in a couple of weeks his intent in writing the book, the purpose, is to establish the believers in Rome. So apparently there's some issue with their establishment. And so he is writing Romans to lay this foundation. In our summaries of the book last week, you saw how it does that through the preaching of the gospel, through our service, through explaining how God uh, was dealing with us and then what, and what he's doing with, with Israel now and the, his, their former promises of salvation. And so all of this foundation is in the book of Romans. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when Paul says that he's a master builder, in verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation you don't see the foundation laid in 1 Corinthians. You see him writing to people he's already ministered to laid a foundation with. And he's rebuking them, saying, what's going on, guys? Romans, he's never been there. He's laying the foundation in Romans. You want to know what the foundation is in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10? It's in Romans. Starting from Romans chapter 1, verse 1. And another builds thereupon, he says, but let every, build, uh, every man take heed how he builds thereupon. And so the how, the 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 what and the description of the foundations are important here. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what is the foundation that Paul's laying as a master builder that he's saying that he laid? Well, it's the foundation of Jesus Christ and him according to the revelation of the mystery. And so when we come to Romans, knowing it's a foundational book, we should then expect Romans to talk about Jesus Christ and him according to the revelation of the mystery. And it, and it does. Okay. Ephesians 2, verse 20 is another place where Paul talks about uh, building the foundation there, uh, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which is going to be Jesus Christ. And so again, Ephesians speaks about a foundation, but we see it being laid in Romans. Ephesians 2, verse 20. He says, uh, you're, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So you see, once again, he mentions the foundation, but he's already laid it in the church of Ephesus. He's dealing with some other things. He's building upon that foundation here. But Romans is the foundation being, being laid. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, Paul says, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Yeah. Well, if there's anything foundational to Christianity, it is the gospel of salvation. It's what makes you a Christian. And you find that in the book of Romans. And if that gospel be hid to you, then, according to Paul, you are lost. In 2 Timothy, we just finished covering that book in 50 lessons. 
in 2 Timothy 1, verse 10 and 11. Paul talks about what Christ revealed and gave to him. He says that the calling and the purpose that was before the world began is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So in his very last epistle we just covered, He's talking about the appearing of Jesus Christ to him to give him the hidden purpose, the mystery of Christ from before the world began. And this is how he was appointed a preacher and apostle to teach the Gentiles, according to this gospel that makes manifest life and immortality through it. And so Romans is the foundational book. And so in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, when Paul says he's a servant of Jesus Christ, we see that's an expected thing. Because there's no other foundation that which can be laid except for Jesus Christ. So he's a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle by Christ, I might add. Christ made him that. And separated unto the gospel of God. We'll deal with that here in a little bit. But of course he is. That is what the foundation of the church is, is the gospel of salvation, the gospel of God. And so we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But he is laying this foundation. Departing from Paul's foundation has meant historically in the church, and means even today, it means heresy, or that you're lost. Heeding Paul and the foundation that he's laid means salvation. That means you hear him and the gospel he's been separated unto, and you believe it unto salvation. That's what that means. Okay. So in verse 1, we see him, those three descriptions of who he is. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. He repeats that throughout his ministry, even to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 10 and 11. In this very first verse of this foundational book, Paul, in those three statements, he's a servant, he's called to be an apostle, he's separated the gospel, you find his heart motive, his authority, and his mission, all right there in chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, so there's a lot of preaching that could be done here, but it's a very doctrinal book, so we need to get out of 2 Timothy and the preaching there, right, and get into the doctrine here. Uh, his heart motive is displayed by that, that idea of being a servant. He doesn't always say that in his epistles in the introduction. I'm an apostle, an apostle, an apostle. Because that's the authority Christ gave him. But here he says, I'm a servant. So he's writing to this Ro the Roman churches here that he's never been to. And the first thing he declares is, look, I'm not serving myself here. He's going to write this book, which is foundational. He's a master builder laying the foundation. He's going to say over and over again, I'm the apostle. I'm laying this foundation. And then he starts off saying, I'm serving Jesus Christ. So that's his heart. He's not trying to boast in himself. He's serving the Lord. His authority, of course, is that the Lord Jesus Christ called him to be an apostle. An apostle is one sent by the Lord, and uh, the, I, the fact that he says that he's called to be an apostle, and that by Jesus Christ, uh, will separate him from the special calling of the other 12 apostles. Okay? Uh, we also have in the third description of him, him being separated under the gospel, his mission. He's separated to do what? Is it simply to uh, elaborate upon something that's already been revealed? Well, we're going to flesh that out in Romans, see if that's true. But he says, separate into the gospel of God. His whole mission and purpose that he's been called to apostle and preach and teach is the gospel. Right? 1 Corinthians 9, 17 says, a dispensation of the gospel was committed unto me. And so his apostolic ministry, Romans, the foundation he's laying on Jesus Christ is a gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? It is what makes you a Christian to believe this good news, this message. So this is where we begin in Romans 1, verse 1. Now, George Williams has a commentary called the Bible Commentary, uh, where he has a very succinct commentary of the whole Bible. So if you're going to get one, it's not a bad one to get. He's not mid-act dispensational, uh, but he is somewhat dispensational, sometimes charismatic. But uh, he says about this, sometimes he's more Pauline than others. That's why it's interesting to read. And about this verse, he says these three statements emphasize the Apostle Paul's independence from the 12 apostles. It's like, wow, yep, he's got that right. From chapter 1, verse 1. There's even people who claim to rightly divide. I don't see that. Don't see it. Right there in chapter 1, verse 1, you see that he can't be one of the 12. Why? Well, we'll, we'll say that here in a moment. That he's a servant of Jesus called an apostle not by Peter, not by a man. He's given a gospel not from a man, not from those who were already preaching a gospel in Jerusalem, but a gospel of God. God gave him this message. He made him an apostle, appointed him 
In 2 Timothy 1, verse 11, he says he appointed me a, a teacher and a preacher. That appointing, that's calling. That's I'm called to be. And so this is his task. Okay? Now, when he says he's a servant of Jesus, Paul was not always one. And that's why we need to, uh, that's why th these phrases indicate his unique apostleship. If here is the cross, <clears throat> and here is the apostle Paul, and uh, how he, when he got saved, which chronologically is in Acts chapter 9 in the scripture here, when Christ appeared to him in that blinding light and appointed him a chosen apostle, uh, he wasn't always a servant of Christ. In Acts chapter 8, verse 3, Acts 8 is after Christ's death and resurrection. He's already left the scene of, of, of earth. He sent the Holy Ghost down to the 12 apostles at Pentecost. And the 12 apostles have been preaching. And in Acts chapter 8, Paul is not Paul yet. He's not saved. He does, he's not a believer in Jesus. And it says that Saul made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, and committing them to prison. That's not a servant of Jesus Christ. He's the enemy. He's the Antichrist, if, in, in a sense, that he's opposing Christ. Acts 9, verse 5. When Christ does appear to him in Acts 9, he's going to capture some more Christians. In Acts 9, verse 5, he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? Now that's a servant. What do you want me to do? He's serving him. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And so there was a time when he was not a servant, and then a time which he was. Look at Acts 9.13. <coughs> the Lord called Ananias to go to Paul to tell him about this special apostleship. And Ananias answered the Lord, saying, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. Not a servant of the saints at Jerusalem. Acts 9, verse 26. When Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple because he formerly was arresting them, you see. So he wasn't always a servant, but something happened. And you read that in Acts 9, of course. You also read it in most of his epistles. Uh, one of the clearest explanations is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where in verse 11... Paul says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Romans 1.1 1, 1, 1 says, he's separated under the gospel of God. The, the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Isn't that the same terminology, by the way? This is the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Take out the adjective, and it's the gospel of God. That's what that is there. Which is committed to my trust. Not to everyone's trust, not to Peter's trust, to my trust, is what he says. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love. So see the and, the grace? It wasn't just that he said, oh, okay, well, you didn't know what you were doing, Paul. That was part of it. But it's also and, the grace, in verse 14, because Christ didn't have to show up. He didn't have to save Paul. Right. So he didn't deserve it. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, who, who revealed himself to him and then explained to him the gospel of his death and resurrection and how he can be saved even though he didn't deserve it. No doubt that was a question for Saul, who was going around uh, arresting people who are claiming to believe in the Messiah, and he, he was opposing him. How can then you call me to an apostleship. I mean, how do I justify this before anyone? Right? Except for just claiming, I saw you on the road to Damascus. And of course, Christ explains to him that it's, I'm sending you to not to preach a message of do good, and then I'll bless you with a high position. It's trust me, and by my grace, you can be saved. Which is to say, you don't deserve it, and you didn't earn it, and I'll give, you, give it to you by grace. Verse 15, this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ, might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them that which, which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. When did that happen in 1 Peter 1 verse 15? Where a gospel is committed to his trust 
a gospel he says saves him as a pattern of long suffering, where he first, what's happening right here, right? When Paul got saved, he's hearkening back to his salvation in 1 Timothy 1. Now, 1 Timothy is one of the later epistles that he writes. But he's hearkening back here to his salvation in Acts 9 of that being the pattern, of that being uh, the gospel of God committed to him, is that being the message of Jesus Christ and his long suffering given to him. Romans 1, verse 1. He's a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. Now look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. <clears throat> Here is where we find the list of the chosen apostles out of Israel's disciples of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse, well, we need verse uh, 2. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. And you read Luke and Mark, you'll find that Jesus actually goes away and prays a bit and then comes back and his disciples come and he says he calls some of them unto him. And here are the names of those that he calls unto him as apostles. These are the names of the twelve apostles. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. There's 12, and you don't find Paul amongst them. Paul was not one of the 12 apostles. You say, well, Judas, you know, he, he's the guy that kicked off the team because he betrayed Jesus. Well, in Acts 1, verse 26, they chose Matthias to replace him by the Holy Ghost explanation there in Acts 1, 26. And they did it based on a criteria that, that whoever was going to replace Judas when he betrayed Jesus had to be with them since Matthew 10. And that was one of the criteria. Paul was not there. He wasn't saved yet back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when they were called to be apostles of Jesus Christ. So when Paul says he's called to be an apostle by Jesus Christ, it wasn't here. Well, when was it? He didn't get saved until here. Jesus Christ came back. This is what George Williams said. What he says here, what Paul says, separates him from these. Because if he was one of the 12 and he was writing back like James or Peter, writing back saying he called me to be an apostle, you'd all understand when, right there. Not Paul. He wasn't saved back then. He wasn't a believer. And so his call to be an apostle was not among the 12 uh, apostles of Israel. In fact, Paul himself testifies to that. In 1 Corinthians 15, he starts listing as witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. And he says he's first seen by Cephas, Peter, and then of all the 12. Which is Paul saying, he's not one of the 12. Because <laughs> he says in the list later, last of all he was seen of me. He doesn't think he's one of the 12. And it's strange to me how certain uh, different groups, even among different fundamentals or Baptists or whomever groups will say, it's not just the Baptists, it's, it's many different scholars who will think that Paul was supposed to replace Judas, to be one of the 12th apostles. I mean, obviously, he wrote 13 epistles in the Bible. That's the guy. Show me the book by Matthias. You don't have one. So if you're picking, you know, the, the pinch hitter there, it'd be Paul. Uh, well, that's not the case. Okay. He's a different apostle with a different apostleship. He was separated unto a gospel that was hid, a gospel that had not yet been known, which we'll see here through the book of Romans, but which is what saves us today. So he was specially called. In Acts 9, verse 15, uh, Jesus says he's a chosen vessel to make him known and to preach him uh, to the children of Israel, to the Gentiles, to kings, and all that. In Romans 11, 13, he's the apostle of the Gentiles. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 5, Paul says he wasn't a whip behind the very chiefest apostles. The very chiefest apostles, which the only other apostles that would be chief were back here. And Paul says over here, I'm not behind them one, one whip. That's interesting. Because among the 12, there was somewhat of an order where Peter, James, and John, they got special privileges, the others did not. And Peter himself got the keys of the kingdom, and Peter was the spokesman in Acts 2. And so, I mean, who, who's heard of anything that Simon the Canaanite said in the scripture? It's kind of hard to find that out. You know. But Peter, he speaks a lot. But Paul says, I'm not behind the very chiefest apostles. He's not behind them, which means he didn't receive his commission from Peter. Right? It's not the Pope sent him out. That's not what happened. Paul says, Christ sent me out. In fact, he rebukes Peter and even has things that Peter didn't know. Well, if you're going to build a foundation of a church, you'd want that guy, I think. 
And that's not because of his own intelligence. It's because Christ revealed him this information that he had not hitherto revealed. But he was called not among the twelve apostles. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the signs of an apostle being wrought among him. Okay. And so his apostleship is unquestioned uh, if you read and believe his epistles. Now, his apostleship was questioned by everyone in the first century because of the very reason I just told you. He's not in that list. He wasn't in Jerusalem. In fact, he was persecuting those guys. So, why should we trust you? And, 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 and how did you become an apostle? Who appointed you? Is the question. 3 Corinthians 12 and verse 11, he says, I have become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So here is Paul claiming to be called by an apostle, and there's so much behind that statement, as we're saying. <clears throat> he thirdly says he's separated under the gospel. His mission was to preach a gospel. A dispensation of the gospel was committed to him, he says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 17. In Galatians 1, let's turn there real quick. He speaks, about, he speaks to the Galatians about turning away from the gospel he preached unto them. And that's why Galatians 1, he defends the gospel he preached unto them as being received by God himself, by Jesus Christ, not by any man. Because they were competing, they were comparing Paul and his message to other men, other apostles, and saying, well, how does that line up, Paul? Because we're getting mixed messages here. And Paul says, well, that's because I didn't receive it from them. Galatians 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So he's an apostle by whom? By Jesus Christ and God the Father. Down in verse 6, he says, I marvel you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul preached the gospel of the grace of Christ, and yet they're removed from it, apparently. Verse 7, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, we just called it before the gospel of the grace of Christ. Here he's calling it the gospel of Christ. In Acts 20, 24, he calls it the gospel of the grace of God. Just saying the same thing as the gospel of the grace of Christ, because Christ is God. It's saying the same thing. He says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let it be accursed. It should be clear from statements like this that there, there is the possibility of preaching different gospels. Not the least of which is this the admission that you can preach a false gospel. Preach another Jesus. The Bible talks about that. So as Christians, we have to be careful to know what is the gospel that saves. What is the true gospel? What is the gospel Christ would have us know? And if Paul's laying the foundation, he starts Romans off saying, I'm separated under the gospel of God. Then we should be listening up to what he says in Romans. Okay? Galatians 1 verse 11, he says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. <clears throat> I did not receive it, neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now again, that only makes sense and has impact when you realize when Paul gets saved. He wasn't one of the apostles back here. He's way over here. He's saying Christ came back after he ascended to heaven and gave me information that I'm telling you guys, that I'm writing the book of Romans about. Right. That's substantial. Why is it that the church doesn't recognize that? doesn't separate Paul from the others. In fact, they explain that Paul is just one of the others, and so he's just sent out from Jerusalem as a missionary or something. What's well, contrary to what the text says in the Bible? Right. So it always boils down. People's mistakes and errors, uh, my own include everybody's mistakes and errors from scriptural interpretation, usually boil down to not st sticking with what the text says, not, not knowing or recognizing and emphasizing the words of the Bible clearly enough. We tend to want to create our own narrative because it makes it simpler for us. If we don't have to deal with everything in the Bible, we'll read the Bible, we'll simplify and simplify and simplify to a point that we've taken out details, create a narrative that we think makes sense. But what we end up doing a lot of times is that narrative is wrong. It's simple, it seems clear, but it's not biblically accurate. And so th this is where a lot of the divergences come from. Meanwhile, he's separated into that gospel. So Paul's a wise master builder. Do you see in Romans chapter 1 verse 1 what he's doing here? in saying these specific three things about himself. In, in fact, Romans is one of the few books he gives himself his, his own name by himself. He doesn't say here Paul and Tertius and Phoebe and Timothy. It's just Paul. A certain Jesus Christ called me an apostle. Why is he doing that? Because he's the master builder. 
He's laying this foundation. To other churches that he's already been to, already ministered there, he goes, it's Paul and Timothy, guys. We're writing to you again. It's, how, it's Paul and Timotheus. It's Paul and Silvanus. And, but to Romans, it's Paul, a servant, an apostle, separated of the gospel, I'm about to declare unto you. Right? Because he's laying the foundation. Do you see what he's doing here? He's laying, laying that thing down. <clears throat> so now we have to deal with, in verse 2, this parenthetical comment. <clears throat> the sentence continues. He says, he separated the gospel of God, the Son of Jesus Christ, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And thus we come to the first stumbling block of uh, those who rightly divide. This verse really is not difficult at all if uh, you do not recognize Paul's apostleship uh, because you think he taught the same thing as Peter. And as we've been covering in our Sunday lessons, everything Jesus did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was prophesied in the Scriptures. And everything he did was, was, was promised back there that would happen. And so if Peter was teaching the same thing as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were, then yes, of course this makes sense. What Paul's ministering was promised before by the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. That's how the Bible works. He, he prophesies before, and things come to pass, and these apostles are ministering that which was prophesied. And that would all be true about the whole apostles. What makes this a stumbling block for those who are learning to rightly divide when they first hear, wait a minute, Paul had a special apostleship, and there's a mystery gospel, there's a mystery truth, and then there's a prophecy truth. One was kept secret, and, and one was revealed in the prophets. And they read this verse in Romans 1, verse 2. Remember the foundational book that Paul's laying down. Why does he say this? Why doesn't he say, as we've been teaching, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, preaching the revelation of the mystery, kept secret as the world began. You, it seems like that verse in Romans 16 should be in chapter 1, right? The way some of us teach it. We're like, that's the foundation right there, Romans 16, preaching Jesus Christ according to Revelation the mystery. Well, actually, as we'll learn hopefully in the lesson today, you can't preach the mystery of Christ unless you first know the foundation that was promised from the beginning of the world, from before the world, but in the prophets. You can't. You can't preach the mystery of Christ in a vacuum of Scripture. You can't do it. You need Jesus Christ to lay a foundation. Well, Jesus who? Christ. Well, what is that? And who's Jesus? And what does it matter? Is he just some random dude that did some things for you? He said, no, he's God. I believe that. Well, how do you know? Are you just some guy you picked to be God? How do we know the stories are true? Well, this goes back to our Sunday series, remember? The only way you know Jesus existed and did what he did and was God manifest in the flesh is from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and all the prophecies in the Scriptures that came before that's the only way you know. And so when Paul's laying a foundation, what is the foundation? Jesus Christ. Now, he will establish the foundation of Jesus Christ and him according to Revelation of the Mystery. But he has to first lay Jesus Christ and then according to the Revelation of the Mystery. You see? That's what he's doing here. So this should not be an issue at all. But unfortunately, because, <clears throat> how do I say it? There are people who are exposed to the Bible rightly divided. They think that this is an issue because... They believe the teachers more than the scripture. And I have to say this with sympathy because we all do this. When you're first learning something, the Bible is so complicated to you. It, it's, it's so much over your head. And it doesn't need to be, but it is. that it, It's like a baby depending on parents for food, right? And so you have to trust your parents for you can pick up the spoon yourself. You know, and it's the same thing. And so we trust teachers, listen to them. We need teachers to teach rightly. And the teachers simplify it. They water down the food. They blend it up. They stir it and cut the, cut the, the steak, you know, so you can chew it up in little pieces. And they do that sometimes to the detriment of the actual quality of the food, right? It's the same thing with the scripture. And so often that happens. And so when you're growing from baby to, you know, I can walk around now a little bit. And I think I can do something with this. If you don't learn that the food you are eating was blended up and mashed, and it wasn't really how it's supposed to be presented, then you're going to be stuck with the baby premise and have all sorts of problems with the bones. Right? See what I'm saying? And so in Romans chapter 1, verse 2, people listen to teachers who preach Paul's mystery gospel. The thought is, well, if what Paul is separated unto here is promised afore by the prophets, this cannot be the mystery gospel of Christ. And so we're going to... Divide that thing. We're going to separate it. Well, this is, this is where we need to deal with this. This Paul's laying a foundation. You get this foundation wrong, you got a problem. And I think we do, by the way. And I think we have an issue 
you, you can't draw a line around a mid-axis movement. You can't do it. Okay, it's just a mess everywhere. People coming in, going out, bringing all sorts of wrong doctrines in and out, and everything else. It's hard to do, find established, faithful people who can rightly divide the word of, word of truth. Okay, uh, people claim it. People say that they do, but it's really hard to find folks. Uh, even even in our own churches, we're trying to establish each other and grow in it. Uh, there are people who have asked me. Maybe you have the same question tonight. You know, what is the mystery? I see that there is one, and I see that it's not prophecy. But what what exactly is it? It's a very good question to ask. But understand, by asking the question, you got to know where you're at in readiness to teach it. If you don't know what it is, you can't teach it. You know, and that's fine. You need to get the answer to the question, right? But when there's people who are teaching it and don't really know what it is, you got a mess, right? And so they, they teach things like that. Like, well, Paul has a mystery gospel, and that verse right there was promised by the prophet. So that's not the mystery gospel. <clears throat> well, what foundation is he laying then? If it's not his foundation given to him by Christ, is he laying Peter's foundation? Is he laying a prophetic foundation? What's he doing here? And so you see the problems it can create. People see that phrase, gospel of God, and they say, well, there are different gospels in the Bible, so maybe this gospel here is a different gospel than, say, the one down in verse 16, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. Well, that's the gospel of salvation right there. And the gospel of God up here in verse, or two, or verse 1 and 2 was promised by the prophets, so I'm just going to separate those two. That prophetic gospel isn't the gospel that saves you. Verse 16 is. Now we've got a dividing line in chapter 1, where he's laying the foundation. You've got a crack in the foundation right there. That's interesting. One reason why people do that is if you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, is Peter also uses the phrase, gospel of God. Well, there you go. If Peter preaches the gospel of God, it can't be Paul's mystery gospel. As Peter and, God, and Paul teach a different gospel. I know, of course, I'm speaking to people who already make that assumption. For most people who don't see it, they have no issue, like I said, with this verse at all. So I'm trying to guard against a problem which um, will come up later in Romans. Uh, and people try to solve it here in chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Peter says, <clears throat> The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, Peter is writing to the strangers of Israel scattered among the Gentile nations. So he's writing to Israel, the remnant of Israel, the little flock of Israel. Peter is preaching a grace that has yet to come to them. They're waiting for the return of Jesus Christ for it. Peter's preaching what the prophets have spoken since the world began, Acts 3, verse 19 to 21. And here in 1 Peter 4, verse 17, Peter says, there are those who don't obey the gospel of God. Well, gospel of God, it's the same language Paul uses in Romans 1, verse 2. And... Paul, Paul says the gospel is promised before by the prophets. Maybe what Paul was preaching in Romans 1, people say, is the same thing Peter's preaching in 1 Peter. You see, this is a problem now, because this seems to undermine the right division of Paul's special apostleship from the Twelve. Or maybe we're just all fooling ourselves, and Paul is teaching the same thing as everybody else. You see, you see the doubt that this engenders. You know, how do I solve this big rock here in this foundation? How do I, how do I deal with this? I might... Also bring to your attention at this moment, since we're bringing up things Peter has said, that Peter is also the one that speaks about being stewards of the manifold grace of God. Doesn't that sound Pauline? By itself it does. Peter's also the one, and uh, you may have used this language. In fact, there's different people in mid circles that use the same language about Pauline doctrine. The language comes from Peter. Where Peter says, grow in God's grace. You ever heard that language? That's Peter. Paul, of course, teaches the idea of growing in God's grace, but he never says that. That's Peter, Peter, Peter's language. So, again, you see the, the possible confusion. Like, well, Peter's talking about grace. Peter's talking about grace. In, Second Peter, or, or in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, what makes it worse is that Mark, when he writes his gospel, it, the very first verse in Mark is what? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've got a gospel of Christ in Mark 1, verse 1. You ever heard that objection? If you're going to separate the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ in Romans 1, what do you do with Mark 1.1? 1, 1? Mark's saying the beginning of the gospel of Christ. Well, it's just the beginning. It doesn't fully get revealed until Paul. But yeah, you got Mark and Paul here dealing with the same things. What you got? What I'm trying to point out here is it's not as simple as drawing a big, thick, black line and say Paul never says anything about prophecy and Peter never says anything about grace. Grace is found throughout the Bible. 
Yes, disproportionately, Paul talks about it, which should indicate something about what Christ gave to him. Grace, right? The dispensation of grace, the abundance of grace, the operation of God by grace. But grace is found in Noah. Grace is found in Exodus, as we've covered weeks ago. Moses found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? And Peter preaches grace as well, just not the dispensation of grace. That's a different thing. So we need to beware. Here's a warning before I get into the, how to solve the verse here. Beware that right division... Right division is not creating divisions where no biblical evidence exists. That is not right division. You say, so and so rightly divides. How do you know that? Because they're drawing a chart with lines on it. You know, it's like, that's, how do you know that's right division? Because they're dividing things. That, right division is not dividing things in the Bible. It's rightly dividing things based on the biblical context and evidence. If there's no biblical evidence, throw the system out the window. I agree with the reformers. If there's no evidence of a dispensational change, then throw the division out. Right? But dispensations, they start loving to div dividing up so much of the scripture because it seems to solve their problems. They think that right division has the purpose of solving biblical problems, and that's not how it is either. Again, this can be miscommunicated by teachers because we're like, well, look, there's so many contradictions in the Bible, and when you rightly divide, it solves it. You've heard this. I've, I've said that you've heard things like this, right? You go, yes, it's glorious. We really divide it. Solves the problems. That's not for me. This is for me. Suddenly my problem just got axed off, you know? So what's that teach you if you have a problem with another verse? What? Just whack that thing off. No got a problem anymore. That's not how we're rightly dividing. It's not that, you know, these are contradictory verses. I can't explain them. We'll just draw a line in the middle and say they're to different people. That's not how it works. It's that you're reading the text and you're seeing as Paul explains it, as Jesus taught it, as the Bible evidences, there's something else happening. Yeah. Right? And so we're trying to figure out what that is. See if it's significant enough to say it's that much different or just a little thing. And when you see that biblical evidence, that's when you say, well, God's changed what he's doing. Because the text says it. If you have no biblical evidence, stop dividing it. So th this is the warning in Romans 1 because Paul's laying a foundation here. People have trouble with verse 2. And they want to put a line there between verse 2 and verse 16. Different Gospels. All right, that'll solve it. You're creating more problems than you now know. Yeah, you solved it temporarily, because now Romans 1 2 is not the mystery Gospel. Romans 1 16 is. But down the road, you've got a big problem, because now you've created two separate callings. Because in Romans 1 verse 1, Paul said, I'm called to be an apostle. When was that? Well, that was here. All right? But if his apostleship's about a mystery Gospel, then maybe he had a separate calling over here. Had a mystery gospel calling and a calling here. There are people teaching this, and they're wrong. There's no evidence of two separate callings like that. But they get there, they derived that from problem verses like Romans 1 verse 2. And they think division's a tool to fix the problems. <laughs> it's not a tool to fix the problem. You don't create the divisions. You read about them. Amen. If they're not there, then you can't divide anything. Okay? So that's the warning. Making... This, Romans 1, verse 2, or 1, 1, the gospel of God here, that was promised to four by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, a different gospel than what Paul was separated unto, that was a pattern for him that was here after belief, making a different gospel than that, opens the door, leaves the door wide open for Paul having two callings, there being two bodies, there being more than one gospel Paul preaches, because that's what exactly you're saying. He's preaching two gospels. And all that's wrong. Right? There's, there's problems with, with all that. So... This is why I'm going through this real slowly here with this issue, because it's a big mess in right division circles. And I know people are going to object to this, but hopefully you're hearing what I'm saying. So remember that we need to trust the Bible. We're studying the Bible verse by verse here. We're not trying to teach a system. I, I am teaching or saying some things that you don't read specifically in Romans 1, but I'm using other verses in Paul's epistles to prove it, I hope. And so we are studying the Bible. Remember to trust the Bible. Use its vocabulary. We talk about dispensations, right? Well, you know you can't find that word dispensation anywhere except for in this dispensation. Use the language of the scripture. It'll help you be more biblically accurate, right? Use the narrative that the Bible tells you. It's very easy, as I said before, to create a narrative about the Bible that sounds biblical. And it, it's understandable and it seems clear, but it's simply not what the Bible says. It's leaving out details, leaving out problem verses, okay? So stick with the Bible's narrative. Stick with the Bible's explanation of things. When Paul says something strange like this, and you're going, why is that? It doesn't seem to fit my narrative. Guess what needs to change? Your narrative, not the text. Okay? And so trust your explanation over teachers. 
And that's usually why we have some of these issues of people are here a teacher, that teacher makes sense to them, open their eyes to some very real and right truths, and then they try to defend the teacher over against the scripture. Yeah. No, no. The teacher's narrative, whatever he taught you, could be right, but it must come from the Bible. It must be defended by the Bible, or else something's wrong in the way you heard it or the way he taught it. The Bible's never wrong. Right? So stick with that. Remember that when you're studying the scripture. The truth is, there are different gospels in the Bible. This is not a statement of a dogma that we create. This is not a denominational statement of faith. Let's, let me show you how it's very clear there's more than one gospel in the scripture. Look, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Some of you don't have to look there. You know what it says. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul here says in very clear language a description of a gospel that he preaches unto them. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. So Paul is the one that preached to them this gospel. Which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So this is the gospel of salvation. Right? They're saved by this gospel. This is, a, this is a gospel that was spoken before, and then he has another one that saves you. This is the gospel that saves. If you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the Twelve, and so on and so forth. He was the, the witnesses of the resurrection. People who saw over 500 people saw Jesus' resurrection. They saw him after he rose from the dead. So the Gospel, what is it? Christ died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, right? The death resurrection, which we often call... The, the, the DBR, the Death Promise Resurrection. Now look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Paul writes this over here in 1 Corinthians. The gospel that saves is you trust in Christ's work on the cross. And you can read in Romans, that's a finished work. Luke 9. Now we're going back before the cross. Jesus is on earth, his earthly ministry, and he's chosen his 12 apostles. And in Luke 9, he's sending them out to preach, to preach the message he's been preaching, which in Mark 1.14 is defined as the gospel of the kingdom. So in Luke chapter 9, in verse, where are we at here? Luke 9, verse uh, 2. That's where I want, yeah, Luke 9, verse 2. And he said unto them, take nothing for your journey. Or, I'm sorry, in verse 2. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What's the message they're preaching here? The kingdom of God. Now, I can't stop there. Because maybe the kingdom of God message includes the death and resurrection of Christ. Maybe he's telling them, go preach the kingdom of God, that I'll die for your sins, and I'll raise again the third day. Maybe he's saying that to them. Okay. Look, look down at Luke chapter 9, verse 6. They departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. What's this gospel? People read into verse 6, by the way, the death, burial, and resurrection. But it's not there. There's the kingdom in verse 1. But this passage alone doesn't tell you whether it includes the cross or not. You might quickly say, well, that's the gospel of the kingdom. That's not the same as Paul's gospel. Yeah, you were told that, but how do you know? Because Luke 9, it could still be there. The kingdom could include the death and resurrection. In fact, I would argue it does in Israel's future. When the kingdom comes, it will be based on the understanding of Christ's death on the cross for their sins. But they were preaching the gospel in Luke 9. They were preaching it to Israel. Look at nine chapters later in Luke 18, 34. They're preaching a gospel. Nine chapters later, Jesus begins to tell them, Luke 18, verse 30, 31, He took unto the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. What are these things the prophets said should be accomplished? He shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. They shall scourge him, put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. It's missing the four-year sins part, but that's pretty much what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He dies, he rises in the third day. And Jesus says, I've got to go to Jerusalem to do that which the prophets said. I've got to go die and rise again. I've got to get spit on and things like this. Look at verse 34. They, the disciples, understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. They didn't know. They had no clue. In Mark 9, 32, it, it has another account of this where he tells them, and it says they were afraid to ask him about it. So much so that later in Matthew 16, or not later, but later in uh, Matthew, uh, he, he's going to be arrested, and Peter tries to prevent his death by fighting for him with a sword, right? These disciples do not know what his death 
like they, they didn't think it even had to happen. Peter, when he first heard about it in Matthew 16, he said, objected. He said, no, Lord, you're not going to die. Not on my watch. Like, I'm, I'm going to defend you to my death. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. I just told you I'm going to do. Why are you objecting to me? Right. And so Jesus, he mentions his death and resurrection as what the prophets spoke about. But the disciples don't know it. What's my point? They were preaching a gospel in Luke 9, verse 6. What in the world were they preaching if not the death and resurrection of Christ? You see, that's the proof. You look at Luke 9 and Luke 18, the gospel they were preaching does not include what they did not understand. Paul says the gospel that saves you is the death and resurrection. He's teaching and understanding it. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, you're still in your sins. There is no gospel that saves you. Well, Christ didn't raise from the dead until much after Luke 18. There's more than one gospel in the Bible. There's an everlasting gospel in Revelation 14 that includes judgment. Angels preach that one flying around the earth. The gospel simply means good news. And depending on the circumstance and the context, it can be different news. Right? We, we as a church ask what gospel we should preach. In fact, not many churches ask that. They just think we preach the gospel and everyone knows what it is. But that's not a given, folks. Not everyone knows what the message is. Not everyone understands why it's good. Not everyone believes the same thing. But we need to get on the same page foundationally on what the gospel is. And Paul's laying a foundation in Romans saying, I was separated under the gospel of God which was promised afore in the Holy Scriptures. Well, we need to pay attention. What is this gospel that saves us? Right. And so, there's different gospels in the Bible, but sometimes the word gospel can refer to the same thing or something similar. Sometimes they're alike. Like I said, I had to go through some, some, some proof there, some evidence to show you they were different. I didn't just assume automatically they were different. That's the difference between trying to rightly divide off the cuff and trying to look for biblical evidence. When someone comes to you and says these Gospels are different, you should say, ah, prove it. Like, why would you think that? There'd be no reason to think that the Gospel is different in the Bible unless you saw evidence, and I just showed you some. So, show me evidence that Romans 1 is different, Romans 1, 2, 1 is different than Romans 1, verse 16, apart from the, that verse in 2, which you think has a problem, but I don't think it is a problem. Right? That's, that's, that's the sole evidence. But look at Romans 1. You know the word Gospel is mentioned more by Paul than any other writer of the Bible. The word gospel, like the very word. 69 times it's used by Paul in all 13 epistles. In the book of Romans, it's used more than any other book of the Bible. 13 times in the book of Romans. Four times in chapter 1, right? Four times. Are there four gospels there? There's the gospel of God, the gospel of His Son, the gospel of Christ. There's the gospel. Are those four different things? It's the same context, folks. It's the same guy laying the same foundation. He's not switching every other sentence. You see, there's no evidence there that they're different. Not the, not the least of which in Romans 15, in verse 16, Paul uses the same language when he says that Jesus Christ sent him to preach the gospel of God as opposed to him ministering to the circumcision. So Paul in Romans 15 is setting himself up as preaching Jesus different than how Jesus preached himself in Matthew, Luke, and John. It says Jesus was the minister of the circumcision. But in Romans 15, verse 16, he says, I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. There, the gospel of God is defined as ministering to the Gentiles. Isn't that part of the mystery gospel? Like, yeah, it is that the offering of the Gentiles would be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. People still object. They say, no, no, that's, that's, that's Gentile covenant under Abraham or something. You know. well, what, what about verse 17 where, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. Paul says, I have to glory in this. If he's preaching another man's gospel and not the one that was revealed specially to him, then what glory does he have to pertain to God? Verse 18, for I will not dare speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me. It seems like he's making abundantly clear here that what he's ministering is what he was given, not what someone else was given. Right? To make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from a Jerusalem round about Illyricum, that's as far as he's went so far, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Gospel of God, Gospel of Christ. Same context, same message. He didn't change it in three verses, did he? Right? That's, he says, that's what I've been doing, preaching the Gospel of Christ. Because Jesus called me to preach the Gospel of God among the Gentiles. The same thing, folks. 
Okay, in this case it is. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. Were we here before? We were. But maybe I didn't emphasize this as I should have. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. He says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. This is his gospel. This is Paul's gospel, my gospel. And so Schofield, who I love what he said in Ephesians 3, verse 6, about our doctrine being found in Paul's epistles alone, was entirely wrong when he's talking about the different gospels in Revelation 14, 6. And he makes Paul's my gospel different than the gospel of Romans chapter 1. Like, no, that is wrong. That's wrong. Romans is Paul's gospel. Okay? The same gospel as 1 Timothy 1, verse 11. It's the gospel of the blessed God. Most yeah. committed to his trust. Okay? Let's move on here. So how, do, how then do you explain this verse, Justin? You've been talking about the problems with misinterpreting it, and that, that those are, though there's different gospels, there can be gospels that have the same name or share uh, commonalities to them. You can call them different things, as Paul does. It's the gospel of God because he gave it. It's the gospel of Christ because Christ is God, and Christ is the one who died on the cross. It's the gospel of grace because what Christ did was give grace to you. It's the gospel of the grace of Christ because it's Jesus' grace that gave it. Right? All these are saying the same thing. But what about Romans 1 verse 2? How, in what sense, was this separation of the gospel of God, which he had promised a four by his holy prophets, how does that make sense? Well, number one, something promised. You might emphasize in your mind there, Paul does not say, I'm separated under the gospel of God, which was written in the prophets before, and I'm fulfilling this. He didn't say, my separation, my apostleship, me being an apostle, is written down in the prophets before. He didn't say this. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, by the way, Paul himself and his apostleship are not the thing that was promised before. Right? You can find Jesus all over the prophets. That's a given. Christ definitely was promised before. Right? And the gospel of God, it's where everyone has the issue. Like, well, what Paul's gospel, was that found back there? Well, he says it was promised before. Something that is promised may not be entirely revealed, you understand. In fact, this is the explanation that people who don't rightly divide give about Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians 3, they say, well, it was back there in the prophets, they just didn't know it, and it wasn't entirely revealed yet. Well, it's possible that that's the case. They're wrong for other evidences. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 2, you could at least say, this is promise. He's not saying everything I'm doing and saying here was already written before. That's what Jesus said in Matthew, Luke, and John. As it is written, as it is written. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying, this gospel I'm separate unto was promised before. I can promise you after the meeting today, well, I won't, but I'm, as an example, I'm promising you a delicious snack after the meeting. And some of you are going, I wonder what it is. I'm not telling you. Guess what? I just promised you something without telling you what it is. Right? It's still a mystery, isn't it? It's a secret. So the gospel he separated unto could have been promised before and still be now revealed as a mystery. It's entirely consistent. Right? It says promised afore. It doesn't say as was spoken before in detail, everything I'm writing to you now. Right? So... If you get an end-of-year bonus, some of you are lucky, if you're lucky enough to have a job that does that sort of thing anymore, end of the year, you're getting a bonus. How much, boss? We'll tell you at the end of the year. You know, it's like, you don't know. That's the point. It's still a mystery. It's still a secret. It's been promised, though. Right? You can find this all throughout the Scripture. There are things promised that wasn't yet revealed. For example, you can find in the Old Testament that people can't keep the law and can't earn or deserve righteousness. You can find that all over the Old Testament. If you're learning the lesson of the law, you can learn that people need to plead for mercy from God. They need His help. Right? What was not revealed is how in the world God could save and justify sinners. How could God save sinners? This was the question Job asked, David asked, nobody knew in the Old Testament. In fact, you can argue a pretty strong case from 2 Timothy 1 and other places that salvation itself, which was spoken of all throughout the Old Testament, therefore promised, was not revealed until the Apostle Paul. That's why he says that he, by the appearing of Jesus Christ, immortality and life was brought to light through the gospel. Well, if the gospel is not immortality and life, then what is it? That's a good question, <laughs> right? But Paul says the gospel he preaches brings immortality and life to everybody through the appearing of Jesus Christ. So there's promises back there that weren't yet known. Salvation itself was revealed to the Apostle Paul, how it worked, the mechanics of it. Okay. He reveals how Christ revealed to him how sinners can be saved without Israel, without the law, without covenants. 
And that's the mystery. But salvation to the world was promised since Abraham. And God promised Abraham the world will be blessed and saved. And here comes Paul saying, guess what? The whole world can be saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's how it's possible. There's no Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ anymore because they're fallen. And you trust Christ's finished work on the cross and all your sins can be paid for. Right? So he's explaining all that. And guess what? The promise of salvation to the world was promised. So, again, not an issue. In Romans chapter 3, in verse 22, Romans 3, 22, Paul says something strange that, again, those who are, are learning to rightly divide, and God bless you, I was there too. These are hard problems. Okay, Romans 3, verse 2, 22, I'm not, I'm not different than you are. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, or I need verse 21, excuse me. Paul says, but now, and we love that but now, don't we? Those things happening before, but now it's changed. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Amen, glory to God. We're not under the law anymore. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Yeah. Shh. This is mystery truth. It's witnessed by the law and the prophets. Isn't you know what it says? If it's not promised to in some way, there's not some way in which the law can witness this that is now happening. And how can you understand Romans 3.22? You see? There are things promised for. There's things, in Galatians 3, Paul says, the law, what, what brought you to Jesus Christ? You say, the mystery. No, 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 no. The law was your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. If you heard the gospel clearly, it began like this. You're a sinner, and you know you're that, because here's God's perfect law, and you've broken all of them. A lot of them, which is no difference. You're a sinner before God. You can't save yourself. Jesus Christ died for your sins. This is the only way you can be saved. You trust his work to be saved. That's the only way you can do it. And so I began teaching you the law. The law is a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. And Paul teaches that in Galatians. Right? Well, that, that's because that's before he got the mystery truth and he was still preaching Peter's gospel. No, no, that's not true at all. Okay. That's how when people start dividing to fit their own system. Let's see. So if things can be promised before, that's not a problem. Number two, how to deal with the verse here, is that our gospel which saves, I'm going to blow some people's minds who are learning rightly divide here, is according to the scriptures. No, it's a mystery kept secret. We just read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. What did Paul say the gospel was? Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. Was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What scriptures? You hear some teachers that are really struggling within themselves go, those must be Paul's scriptures. No, 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 no. Those are Old Testament prophetic scriptures. But if you do that, it's not a mystery. No, that's a wrong premise. That's a wrong premise to think that if Paul ever mentions a prophecy or says the scriptures somehow relate to our foundation today, that's wrong. No, it's not. You can't preach the mystery of Christ except upon the foundation that was promised by the scriptures. What's the foundation? Jesus Christ. That's the gospel we preach, folks. If you don't understand that according to the scriptures, then you're throwing a part of the Bible away. And didn't, don't you know, as your objectors say, that Paul says all Scripture is profitable? Yes, indeed it is. So our gospel is according to the Scriptures. In fact, we've read a couple already where Jesus himself says, i got to go die and raise from the dead, as the Scriptures say. Now, he wasn't offering that as a good news, as a gospel of salvation to anybody, <laughs> by any means. And he wasn't talking about at that moment that he was going to die for sins, which is a big deal with the gospel you and I preach. But his death and resurrection was prophesied according to the Scriptures. In Luke 24, after he rose from the dead, Jesus has to explain to his disciples, look, all the law and Moses and the Psalms and prophets said about me that I need to suffer and then raise from the dead. That's why I did that, because they all wrote about it. Then we just teach this last Sunday. One of the purposes for which Christ came was to die and rise from the dead, to fulfill the scriptures, to bring in their new covenant, right, to mediate that. He had to do it according to the scriptures. So it's, 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 uh, it says something that folks who think they see the mystery or right division are learning for the first time through this series on Sunday that he had to come to die according to prophecy. Like, it should have began there. You first should learn that. Then you learn the mystery. But the churches are so out of whack these days that who knows what people are learning? Nothing. You know, they're learning nothing. But that's fine. That's why we come together and study and grow together. But we have here our gospel according to the scriptures. Acts 26, verse 7, another so-called problem verse for people who don't quite get what Paul's laying in his foundation or what the mystery of Christ is built upon. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is on trial defending what he's saying and preaching 
against his unbelieving Jewish brethren. And he makes this statement, which causes people who aren't really established, don't quite get the book of Romans entirely, to fly off the deep end. Acts 26, <clears throat> verse 7. Unto which promise? He says in verse uh, 6, Now I stand and am judged. This is Paul speaking. I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. When did that promise get made to the fathers? Was it in Acts 9? Like, well, no. That, that promise made to the fathers of Israel was way back here. And Paul says, I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. This is interesting. Isn't this the guy that was said a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me? And it says, I preach a mystery kept secret. What's he talking about? What's this, what's this promise? Unto which promise are 12 tribes, Israel, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. There it is. See, Paul doesn't have the mystery yet. He's preaching prophecy. Of course he is. I do too. When I preach Jesus Christ according to the mystery, I don't exclude prophecy. I have to teach it all together. Or else it doesn't make any sense. How do you know it's a mystery unless there's prophecy? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's like preaching nothing without something. But anyway, it says, Unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come? For which hope sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought, he's going to reveal what the promise is, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? That's what he's preaching. He's being accused of preaching this weird, crazy doctrine of Jesus raising from the dead. And Paul's going, that promise of resurrection was given to the fathers. Yeah. That's not new. Right? Why is that a strange thing? Right? And so, you see, that, that's what he's saying there. So, we preach resurrection according to the mystery, but it was promised before. Yeah. That's how we should understand it. Paul says, Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead, of the seed of David, as prophesied before, raised from the dead, according to my gospel. 2 Timothy 2, verse 7. The according to means like, for this purpose. You know, so he, he did it to fulfill prophecy, but for the purpose now revealed. That's how you understand the mystery. Okay. Number three, reason how to explain the verse in Romans 1 verse 2. How was this gospel he separated unto promised afore? Number three, that the scriptures promised salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Some of you are, are really, I know this is hard for some of you. You're going, what? Justin, you're really giving up this whole mystery thing. Look at 2 Timothy 3. I'm not. I'm, I'm actually sticking to the scriptures Paul teaches, and I believe that Romans 1 is preaching the mystery gospel. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. We just studied this, didn't we? 2 Timothy? Spent 15 weeks in these two verses. Paul says what to Timothy? From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. What scriptures is Paul talking about in verse 15? We've already covered it. From a child, th these were not... This is not the epistle of 2 Timothy. This is Old Testament stuff. Right? The Bible hadn't yet been put together. But what are these Old Testament scriptures able to do to, to Timothy? Make him wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Timothy heard the gospel from Paul. The gospel of the grace of God. The gospel that was revealed to him in Jesus Christ. And because he knew the scriptures and the need for faith, the need for a savior, the need for righteousness, not by his own works, he was primed to hear what Paul said because the scriptures were able to make him wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You can learn all those elements right there in the Old Testament, except for the name Jesus, because that wasn't known until he came in the flesh in Matthew 1, 23. Right? Christ was prophesied, coming Messiah. Salvation, that was promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Right? Faith, that's everywhere. We're going back to Abel, there's faith. Faith, salvation, Christ, those are all over the Old Testament. How you get them today is what the mystery is. Because those things promised in the Old Testament were said to be fulfilled over here. And Paul's saying, you can have them now. Well, that is a mystery. Right? So now we're getting closer to what that mystery is. It's not the thing that was promised, which was salvation to the world. It's how we have it now, especially when the world doesn't look like it's saved. Right? That would be the mystery that Paul talks about. So, Paul taught salvation through faith in Christ according to the mystery. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 8. If you don't recognize these things, you'll say, you'll say things that testify a lack of understanding of it. 
And again, I, I know from experience, folks, because I was there too, where you say the mystery of Christ is Christ's death and resurrection for your sins. And you're just like, well, that, that's pretty oversimplified. That is the gospel we preach. And 1 Corinthians 15, it really is just the beginning of that, right? Because he died for your sins, he rose from the dead. That's what you believe. But we kind of mean by saying that you do nothing else. <laughs> it's finished. Well, that's an important part of that communication. The whole Catholic Church thinks Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. They don't think he finished it. Right? So there's, there's a mystery part to that message that wasn't articulated in the prophets. He's chapter 3, verse 8. Paul says, Unto me, and the less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable, the mid Acts preacher says. That means you can't find them in the Old Testament scriptures. And indeed, that's correct. He's preaching the unsearchable riches. Of what? Christ. You can find him back there. There are searchable riches of Christ that you can find. Paul is simply making known the unsearchable ones. Right? So that's the mystery part. But you can find Christ back there. So when he's called to be an apostle of Christ, a servant of Christ, separated under the gospel of God, which was promised to four, but didn't fully reveal what I'm about to tell you, you know. We know that, by the way, because he says that in Romans later. But Paul teaches that. Reason number four. If something is promised, as I just mentioned, and given out of the due time, that is a mystery. If something is promised before about... Next week, if I promised you for a snack at the end of our lesson and suddenly I started handing it out in the middle, well, I didn't tell you about that, did I? I did promise a snack, didn't I? Yeah, but not at this time, right? I thought you were coming next week. What a surprise, you're coming today to my house. Yeah, it was a mystery. You knew that it was promised, it was going to happen, you just, you were surprised at when, right? And this is an element, too, in the mystery of Christ. Christ died for our sins. We get forgiveness. We get atonement now. Well, that atonement was promised to Israel to come in the future. Yeah. And you have it now. Well, that's the mystery part. It's not the atonement itself. It's when. That time element is very important for this mystery. Paul says on 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Last of all, you've seen of me as of one born out of due time. It wasn't the fact that Paul was even saved by grace that was something untold in the Scriptures. It was when and how. He was saved by grace in Acts 9 before the kingdom came, before Israel was saved. It was out of due time. It wasn't time yet for all of Israel to be saved because they weren't. All Israel rejected Christ. And here comes the, the chief rejecter, and he gets saved by grace. That's out of due time. That's part of that mystery. You can read all over the Old Testament these things that concern our salvation and gospel that are out of time and thus out of place. And I'm not saying here you can take these passages as talking about you. They're not. Okay? But in Genesis 3.15, when the promise was given to, to, to the devil, but to the Hebrews in Genesis there, that, uh, that, that the seed of the woman, Jesus, would bruise the head of the devil. Right? That was given to them. Not you. And yet, we kind of benefit from Christ dying on the cross and raising from the dead. You know, so it's like you can read things back there that were promised that out of due time now applied to you. Woo! Praise God, according to the mystery. Right? Or, or Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, The just shall live by his faith. Paul will quote that in Romans 1. Right? Using a slightly different language, but he quotes it. So he's quoting a promise or something said back in Habakkuk chapter 2, which is about Israel, folks. We studied the book. It's about Israel and their kingdom program, prophecy. It had nothing to do with the mystery of Christ. But he does mention, man shall be justified by his faith by faith. And Paul says the same thing. Okay. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. He says, when all Israel is saved, in so many words, when Israel dwells in the land and they dwell safely, the Lord will be the Lord our righteousness. Now, oh, isn't the Lord our righteousness today? Yes. What, you, what would be a wrong explanation there is to say, oh, well, since he's our Lord today, righteousness, that's talking about us. No, it's talking about Israel. When they dwell in the land safely, the Lord will be called Lord our righteousness. So the fact that you can call the Lord our righteousness today, and you're not Israel, and they're not in the land safely, that's a mystery, folks. Like, how does that thing happen to now? You see, because Israel's not there. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, verse 11, where it says that he justifies many and bore their iniquities. Well, could you say he justifies many today in the body of Christ? He justified me by faith, justified you by faith? You could say that, but Isaiah 53 is talking about Israel. Isaiah 53 is talking about their future kingdom and how their, Isaiah 53 is actually being said by future Israel. 
We studied this in detail back in Isaiah. So anyway, I'm just showing you how Romans 1-2 is not an issue when you actually understand what the mystery is and how it's related to the rest of Scripture. And this, this idea that we need to take the mystery and totally separate it from Scripture is what causes these problems. And why people will cut off the whole book of Romans, because they'll eventually read Romans and go, there's a lot of prophecy in there, and cut the whole thing off. And now, as we said at the beginning of the book, beginning of the lesson tonight, you have lost the gospel, folks. You depart from Paul, you depart from the foundation, now you've got a bigger problem. You see? So I'm trying to show you how you can explain this verse, okay? The, the fifth reason I have on your outline there is that the mystery itself, look at Ephesians 3, verse 6. This is a verse that defines the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, 4, he says, When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is the definition. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his, what's that word? Promise. Partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The definition of the mystery in Ephesians 3, 6 is that we partake of a promise. When did that promise occur? That's not a promise that was given to you when you got saved. That was a promise of life that God promised to Israel and before the world began that you now partake of according to the mystery. Romans 1 verse 2, I separated into the gospel of God, which was promised before. Of course, if you only make that gospel, you getting eternal life, according to the mystery, it was promised before in the Holy Scriptures. Titus 1 verse 2, Paul says eternal life, which was promised since the world began, from the beginning of the world. It was promised by God. Okay? So it's defined in the mystery itself. Again, go back to 2 Timothy, the last epistle that Paul writes and that we just finished studying. Isn't it great to study the very last and now the very first of his epistles? Or at least foundationally. 2 Timothy 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Well, that promise of life in Christ was given to Israel in the Old Testament, you know. The mystery is how you got it. How'd that happen? Israel is waiting for the Messiah. Even today they're waiting for the Messiah to come and bring them life and salvation and everything else. You have it. So, promise to four, not an issue. I hope you're seeing that. Okay. What is he saying then by the, by the gospel of God? Eternal life was promised, salvation was promised, Christ was promised, forgiveness was promised. When he says separate into the gospel of God, Paul is simply saying here that he's not the one that invented this thing. He didn't receive it from a man. The gospel came from God. Just the same thing he said in Galatians 1 verse 1. I did not receive it of any man. I received it from God the Father. Received what from God the Father? My gospel. What do you then call that? Gospel of God? Yep. That's what he did in Romans 1 verse 1. And it was promised, as we've just explained already. In fact, like I said, Paul is the one that uses the word gospel more than any other Bible writer. You could say the gospel that saves is something that is preeminently in Paul's writings. So if any writer of the Bible explains the gospel, it's Paul. Do you get it? We have to search around. I think it's only, uh, what's it, 14, 15 times in all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the word gospel used. That's it. How many times do you think it is in the book of John? I mean, John, John 3, 16, it's pretty evangelistic, that message in John. Zero. Big fat egg. No times is the word gospel used in the gospel of John. You say, well, that doesn't mean it's not trying to get people to believe. No, I get it. It is. <laughs> but the gospel that brings immortality and life to light is something that Paul reveals. Okay. And so separating the gospel of God, that's Paul's message, folks. Because I've read the end of the book of Romans. All right? I've read the rest of his epistle. He's just studied 2 Timothy. Okay, this is not something different. It's not foreign to it. So, when you want to know what's promised to four, well, stick around. This will come up again in Romans 1 through 5. The next four chapters, Paul is going to quote prophecy after prophecy, law after promise, and he'll explain it. He will explain those scriptures according to Jesus, according to the revelation of the mystery, and you'll learn how promises before you're now preaching that you have according to the mystery. Okay. In fact, in Romans 1, the very context, if you just keep reading, we often, sometimes when we find a problem in the Bible, in like a verse... Those of us who are studious about it, we tend to like get real close to it. You know, there's a problem verse. Okay, I'm gonna look right at that thing. Every word. Maybe I should go behind the word and look underneath the word. And that's fine and good. But sometimes it's helpful to step back 
problem verse. Let's step back. And we, we tend not to do that because we want to answer that verse. Well, step back. Maybe the context will give you an inkling about the answer. Romans 1, he's separated in the gospel of God, which was promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was promised and prophesied and came and fulfilled a lot of those things. What was promised before, I wonder? Jesus was? This is what people will make the gospel of God. They'll say, well, the gospel of God is just Jesus according to prophecy. I hope I've been showing you that. No, that, that's, that's limiting what Paul's teaching. But he says, concerning Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, that is definitely here. Right? But he's not done yet. The sentence goes on. <laughs> and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Well, now we're here. Right? By whom we have received grace and apostleship. When's this happen? Oh, here. You see? He's not preaching something different. He's just at the beginning of his epistle saying, I'm serving Jesus Christ. You know who I'm talking about, Jesus Christ? He was promised a four. Seed of David, made according to the flesh, raised from the dead, made me an apostle. Writing to you guys at Rome. That's what he's saying. So we'll end here tonight. I know I couldn't finish the, the, the verses, but uh, we'll finish them next week. I'll end with the statement here, just as a summarize the, the explanation of this verse, is that the mystery of Christ that we'll eventually learn in the book of Romans here we need to understand, some of you already have an idea of what it's going to be. But it's built upon a foundation that was promised in the Holy Scriptures. All of the Bible, all of the Scriptures come together. Okay? Paul in Colossians 1.25 says, it was given to him to fulfill the Word of God. We just taught this in 2 Timothy. He says, all Scripture was given by inspiration of God. And Paul was the one that fulfilled, he wrote the, the final things. He wrapped it all up. The, there's no more revelation that's going to occur. All right? And so when he says, I was separated in the gospel of God, he was separated to finish this thing God started when he promised salvation since the beginning and from before the beginning. And now it's revealed to Paul how all that works, you see. So yeah, it was promised before concerning his son, Jesus Christ, by whom we are now made apostle, uh, given grace and apostleship, Romans 1 verse 5. This built on that foundation, okay, the foundation which is Jesus Christ, and we preach according to Revelation of the Mystery. When you, when you lay a foundation, you got to dig a hole. And then you got to put rocks in it like this, or concrete, you got to pour down in there. And then you lay the foundation brick, right? Construction guys can verify this perhaps. This is somewhat how it works. Well, if I'm built, digging that hole, what are you thinking I'm doing? And, well, he's doing something there. He's making a square. He's probably laying a foundation. But it hasn't really come yet. It's just a hole in the ground. Start laying some rocks down in there. Right? You go, yep, he's, he's laying a foundation. But is it done? Is it laid yet? No, nope, not yet. Just laying those rocks down there. Like it's starting to happen. And you lay that brick. What happened in prophecy, it's, just, it's making that hole. It's going, look, we need something here. Prophecy promised it. Jesus came in the flesh. And guess what? He says, I'm the rock. Well, good. We need some rock. And then here comes Paul. And he goes, I've laid the foundation. Like he finished it. He put that stone and said, this is it. This is how we know Jesus Christ. This is what his purpose was from before the world began. Before he started digging that hole, this is what he wanted to happen. And th that's how you should think of it. So the mystery is not prophecy. But it's built upon the foundation of all scripture. Without knowing scripture, you don't know what the mystery is necessarily. Okay? All right. We'll end there and pick up uh, verse uh, 3 through 5 next week. Any questions or comments, folks?